We are talking about rape today. Yes, rape because a counselor has incurred the wrath of some people, including showbiz personalities, with his comment on the subject. Councillor Lutroth is on the chopping board after saying that victims of rape do enjoy the act at a point. Later on, we'll talk about politics. Have you registered for a voter's ID? Do you intend to? Well, actress Yvonne Nelson is advising that persons who are yet to register should not bother themselves, rather spare themselves of the risk of contracting coronavirus. My name is Benefo Bwabin Abrantipa. Welcome to Bloggers Forum on Ghana Web TV. Welcome back to Bloggers Forum here on Ghana Web TV. Uh, my guests are already seated. Today, on this episode, I have two columnists. Nenebi is a, is a regular face. Nenebi is a columnist. Nene, welcome. Thank you. And uh, joining us for the very first time is he's a debater, <laughs> uh, a former colleague. We're, we're all at Radio Universe. He's with Class Media Group. And he's also a columnist, Abdul Karim Ibrahim. Karim, welcome. Thank you very much. Nice. So we delve straight into the discussion. We, we start with um, Councillor Lutros, who has been enjoying uh, bad publicity, I should say. Well, his comments on the rape victims, according to him, every victim at a point in time enjoys the action. This is what happened. Every rape victim enjoys the act before the conclusion. Yes. Yes. Send the research, yes, is there? Because every rape victim at a point in time, or yan or yan who say I want to end the thing. Jadoy and Jadoy by the point in time. The the uh, the nerves gives in to the act. No, no, it, you give in to the act because without it, you own uh, uh, normal penetration. So the research has proven said no matter what happens, regardless of the uh, the act is enjoyed. That is why we have cases where people have been sexually molested, raped, but the act is associated to orgasm. And so we are one. They expect such actions before they can enjoy consensual sexual intercourse because our system no are building up with a non-consensual system. I am telling you, but, 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 but don't, don't say that anybody who has been raped I'm, 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 I'm telling you that. I'm telling you that. No, it's no. Every act of Counselor. raping. No, there is an enjoyment. No, wrong. Totally wrong. I will give you enjoyment. Right, so let me let me begin the conversation with um, the man who always quotes. I don't know whether he will quote someone uh, <laughs> in this conversation. Nene, yeah, you've 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 watched the video. You've mm -hmm. seen um, comments that are coming in. Yeah. What's your position on the issue? My position on the video, or my position on on what he said. On what he said. Yes. That every victim of rape. Yeah. He said every. Every okay, <laughs> that's what the problem is. Mm. The problem is with the word every, right? Mm. But before I say this, this is the first time ever in my life ever I'm talking about Councillor Lutrot. I've never talked about him before because I have a personal policy of not talking about people whose opinion and uh, positions on things in life doesn't add anything to my life, right? There are two types of people you disagree with. There are people you disagree with that you can learn from. And there are people you disagree with that there is no benefit to listening to them. Mm. And he happens to fall under the category of people I disagree with that I don't see any benefit of listening to him. So I probably wouldn't have paid attention to this video in the first place if I didn't have to talk about it. Mm. So the content of the video obviously is something that I think is full of crap and shouldn't be entertained by any sane, uh, well-thinking human being. But there is this, um, scientifically speaking, right, rape is sex. 
whether sex with consent or sex without consent is sex, right? Mm. So there is this notion that, or there is this belief that people who get raped at a point probably will get uh, stimulated, they'll get wet because there is some penetration or there is some action in their body happening, mm. whether they consider to it or not. So some victim of rape might, in the midst of the act, start developing uh, uh, feelings or sexual feelings which can, somebody might uh, explain that to be uh, enjoying it. Mm. But that is not every victim because, yeah, that's let me explain it that way. <laughs> not every victim. Not every victim. Yes. I see. Um, Karim, oh, your, your, your pre preliminary statement on the issue. Well, for me, I guess I should start from where Nene ended. Um, I don't even believe that whether or not, I mean, the, the numbers matter at all. I mean, I think it's completely irrelevant to, to any conversation on, on rape, and especially the claims that uh, Councillor Lutrot uh, made. I mean, so if we were to be distracted to engage in the question of whether the semantics is important. Is it everybody? Is it a few people? Is it 10 people? Is it 100 people? Then essentially, we are inadvertently buying into or subscribing or agreeing that there's some credit to what he's saying. I mean, imagine if you stole food, right? Let's say you like rice. If you stole rice and you ate it, I mean, it's rice. You probably are going to love uh, eating the rice. But when we are talking about your action, it would not matter whether you enjoy the food or someone else who might have come to pick a food that you stole, ate the food and enjoyed it. I mean, as you mentioned, by the very nature of the biological process or the physical contact that comes in, obviously, there may be some delight or enjoyment or anything like that. But to even allow yourself to get into that conversation is to be somehow um, conceding or accepting what the, the gentleman said. And I think that his, his comments are, are, are completely um, off. And I'm not surprised, actually, around but I've heard a lot of people complain and call his comments all sort of names. But he, he is a representation of so many other people who believe that. And so, I would hope that at this moment that this has come up, everybody's talking about it, we we'll seize the moment to reflect on rape and ask ourselves that what exactly do we also believe or think about rape? I mean, maybe we would not say it on radio, on TV like he did, but when you sit down and you ask yourself, what's the conclusion that you come to when issues of rape come to mind? I mean, I, I want to believe that quite a number of us would believe or like to believe that, well, to the extent that you enjoy or probably get wet and all of that, then yeah. But I think that this is the most irrelevant thing at all. If you look at the scenario of somebody stealing food or stealing toffee and eating the toffee and still enjoying the sweetness of the toffee, it never comes up when we're talking about food. Why must that be material here when you're talking about rape? There are concerns that his comments is fooling rape culture. You agree? Well, I, I, I agree. I agree, but also I do not subscribe to that in the way that, comment, that sort of position has been put out there. Because what, what it, it suggests is that Councillor Lutrot has this sort of influence, and, and for that matter, when he says that, someone picks that and uses that to conduct a rip. I don't think that is the case. While I agree that his position sort of reinforces some dominant narrative out there that, well, rape is not that bad. I mean, we see across different cultures how they um, react to rape and rape culture and all of that. So to that extent, yes, he's participating in that. But I do not believe that his comments necessarily um, encourage someone to go and rape. What it essentially does is that it takes away something from the victims and in all of our conversation on rape what we must never do is to seek to rationalize it 
is to, is to seek to take away the power of the victim to express themselves and to complain. Because we see that a lot with what, when we hear stories of somebody being raped, the first question a lot of people ask, uh, what were you wearing? I mean, what were you doing there at that time of the night? This is no different from that. And so I would really hope that right, for those especially who have found the need to complain, to insult Councillor Lutrot, should ask themselves, how much do they themselves also con contribute to this whole discourse on rape? Do they, when they see someone raped, ask the question, what, uh, what were they wearing? How short or long was their skirt? And all of those things. I don't think that they are any different mm. from the sort of comments that we have heard him make. Right. So, like I indicated earlier, um, a number of showbiz personalities have been commenting on it. The first one I saw was from Amaki Abebrese, and yeah. uh, he posted a, a video, the video that you just watched, on her Twitter page. Uh, this is what she wrote. Every rape victim enjoys the act. This is a quote from a self-professed counselor, George Lutrot, from Ghana on a TV station, on a TV show yesterday. He goes on to say that rape victims enjoy being raped regardless of their unwillingness in being in beginning of an act of rape. Then uh, EL comes in and says, personally, I don't blame Lutrot. He can't be helped. I blame the stations that continue to give him the platform to spew and spread this his dangerous and ignorant rhetoric. Chase Forever comes in to say, told you to cancel this whackness of mentality from TV. Even some women insulted me in the comment session, shaking my head. Can't make it up. This is crazy. Juliet Ibrahim comes in to say, yes, this is fueling rape culture and sexual violence. This is a clear case of rapist who's sending out a direct message to the general public that rape is okay. In his own words, he must be arrested and used as a scapegoat. Uh, singer Deborah Vanessa also comes in to say, so ironic that the one with the mouth has no nose mask on. Uh, he promotes rape culture, victim blaming, uh, slut shaming, sexual objectification. He should not be given a media platform to push such a harm agenda. Actress Lydia Fortune also comes in to say, you should direct your anger at the media houses who continue to give this man a platform to spew such dangerous narratives. Mm -hmm. The Ghana Psychological Council dissociated itself from him and wrote to media houses to that effect. JB says, that's my guy, but this is wrong. Nene, you think the media is playing a part, a role in all this? Whether the media should be blamed for um, what was the name for his message or for the fact that he is relevant, I'll ask: Should the media be blamed for Trump becoming president? Should the media be blamed for uh, what was the name? The way we conduct ourselves in this country? Should the media be blamed for everything wrong with? everything in this country. I don't think the media should be blamed for anything. The media, what the media does is, the media feed the people what the people want. Mm. Sometimes, some media houses try to set agenda by, you know, giving the people what they need. Mm. But majority of the time, you and I know that the media relies on traffic. And it's traffic that gives you advertisement mm. this advertisement that gives you money so when there is somebody who gives you traffic will you get the person off your airwaves even if the person is spewing a dangerous rhetoric yes. i don't think so yes. if i'm a businessman being, be, be, yes. be, being a gatekeeper you don't think if you, I'm a you business need to man. save the society okay so let me give you an example I have to quote, <laughs> right? Yeah. Today, I happened to notice that most of the, the two books that were written against Trump, why, were published by a publishing house, which published the book that was his campaign manifesto. 
that was uh, that he put out in 2015. And then the title of the book was changed to Great Again 2016, so that it would reflect his campaign message. Mm. And that book was the highest selling book uh, by any presidential candidate in that year. And that happened to make the publishing house believe that the name Trump sells. So we have to put out more books about him. Mm. And so they keep publishing books by anybody who has anything to say about him, whether positive or negative. And that media house, that publishing house is owned by a company that owns Comedy Central. And not even notice, a lot of Comedy Central programming before Trump became president were more of entertainment that had to do with politics. Mm. And now most of their programs have to do with politics. Because they realize that the person who is in the White House now brings traffic. And so whether we like him or not, it's our job to profit of something that gives us traffic. And so the media's job is not to be a gatekeeper. I don't think it is. Mm. Sometimes they can do that. But their job as a business entity is to make money. So if people don't want to hear Councillor Lutrot say the things that they hear him say, they should do what I do, which is I don't talk about him. If you don't like somebody and you talk about the person, what you are doing is you are making the person relevant. Mm. It doesn't matter whether you think you are doing your, the people who are uh, listening to him a favor by talking about him. The more you talk about him, the more you relevant you make him. Okay. Uh, yeah. you, you, you have been in the media for yeah. so long a time. You used to even host the morning show um, with Universe. And you're doing the same with class, right? Um, I'm, I'm on the morning show. Morning show. Yeah. You think the media should be blamed? Yeah. To what extent? So, um, earlier, I held the view that um, the media has a responsibility, mm. but also we must be careful in how we attribute the, the blame. But now, I mean, and also listening to Nene, I can understand how since this came and for many other cases, we've seen a lot of people want to uh, put the blame squarely at the doorstep of the media. Because if you rationalize the issues the way Nene has done, and I think that I've heard quite a, seen a lot of people uh, do similarly, then you are left with a lot of questions. So one of such questions would be, why does the media have the sort of rights and entitlements that they have? I can agree that if it was entirely a case of a private business just going out there and make money, then it would make a lot of sense to not expect too much from the media in terms of um, some of these normative expectations and all of that. But that's not entirely what the media does. There's a reason the media, in the sense of it, is not the same as, say, an advertising company. So there is an expectation in there that the that as you have the right to express yourself, as you have the right to when you publish any material within that line of work, it would not be used against you, among many other things. I mean, the Constitution of Ghana, for instance, recognizes that. And that is almost the same for every country that has liberal values, democracy, and all of that. So what it means, therefore, is that the media's rights and the privileges that the media enjoy are not without responsibility. And it is this responsibility that therefore requires that if there is a toxic behavior or person who perpetuates anything like that, you must exercise a certain editorial discretion to cut that person out. And so to that extent, yes, the media has a, a, a blame to take. But you see, I can also understand that within that, it does not mean, therefore, that if a media house entertains such a character, you shut that media house down. Because it's also within the remit of free speech to allow varying degrees of opinions and even the most provocative of things that anybody at all can see. So it's, it's uh, more or less, um, you know, music more, maybe a double entendre, something like that happening there. Because both of the situations can be true and can be accurate. But I do believe that, I mean, it, it's, it's not so easy as many, uh, 
I'm, I'm sorry that when you, you mention debate, and it's like I'm debating the level. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. I like debates. Yeah. <laughs> See, it's, it's not so easy to say, well, if you don't like it, don't talk about him or stay out of it. Yeah. Because the way the media works and the way narratives are shaped and views are informed and all of that. I mean, I was just watching a documentary recently about how almost all the wars or some aggression that we've seen from the U.S. and many other, in NATO and the rest, have all been informed and helped greatly by the media. When the information is put out there, the way the media shifts that narrative. So, I mean, the media obviously wants somebody to speak on relationship matters. The fact that Councillor Lutrot is in there is not necessarily because that's what people want. He's in there because that is what the media has put out there. And by our consumption of it, by our participation in it, it creates a certain culture, a certain acceptance. I mean, it's, it's the mind. There are a lot of things that we're, we're coming to like that ordinary labyrinth, but we would not. Yes. So the, there is a petition to yes. get him banned from radio and TV. Yeah. Uh, as we speak, it has garnered um, 13,231. Yeah. Uh, much ado about nothing. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, well, me, yes, I'll, I'll go to him later. Yeah, but quick so, one for me on that. Um, much ado about nothing. I think it's dangerous. Mm. I think it's, I can understand the rationale and the, and the goal, but I think it's a dangerous action that anybody would want to take because what it's essentially asking for, and I've seen that they've petitioned the um, National Media Commission, mm -hmm. um, the Ministry of, Ministry of uh, Communication, yeah. um, media yeah, houses. Op Opon Krumah has actually spoken against the, the comment. Yeah, I've, I've, seen, I've seen his tweet. I mean, I mean, if you look at the fact that they are targeting um, the agencies or institutions that regulate the media, for me, I think that is, that is a no-no. Because whether you like it or not, I mean, as deplorable and as, as horrible as this um, claim and suggestion and the sort of things that he says really are, there are a good number of people who share in his view. And today, it is Councillor Lutrot that is saying something that we did not like. The woman will begin to invite state agencies to creep into the arena of free speech and expression because we don't like A or B. Tomorrow, it will just be a best bloggers forum. I mean, if someone doesn't like what you are saying, it doesn't necessarily have to ad address or breach some societal ethos. The person may just not like it. And then we'll petition the National Media Commission and you will be shocked that we'll have some 10,000, 100,000 people also agreeing with them, and tomorrow your show will be off. So I don't think that's the approach at all. Nene, yeah. your comment on the petition. Yeah, so my favorite quote, I've used it on this platform <laughs> once, and I've used it in the article I wrote for Ghana Web once, that the purpose of free speech is not to protect you from speech you like, but to protect speech you don't like. The purpose of free speech is not to protect speech you like, mm. but to protect speech you don't like. Because nobody needs protection from speech they like. Yeah. If you like a speech, you don't need protection from it because that is a speech that, you know, is favorable to you. Mm. But when it's speech that you don't like, that is when the issue of free speech comes in. And so when you start inviting, like he said, the government or government agencies to have a say in matter of free speech, then you are giving the government more arm than it already does. So tomorrow we can say that nobody should say anything about the president anymore. Mm. And that becomes uh, something that we have already empowered the government to do with the Councillor Lutrot issue. You understand? Okay, right. Um, there are calls for <laughs> Lutrot's arrest. Yes, there are calls for Councillor Lutrot to be arrested. Now, this is what lawyer Sosu has to say about that call. The call to get him arrested are uh, unfounded. There is no uh, uh, any basis for those calls because under the constitution, an act is a crime if it is clearly defined by the constitution and its penalties prescribed. Um, there is nowhere in the constitution that uh, it said that somebody's public statement 
either by way of um, his opinion, uh, promoting uh, what may be like criminal uh, amounts to a crime. Uh, there is no nowhere in our laws where speech has been criminalized. So it doesn't matter how uh, bad the, script, uh, the, the speech is. Uh, there is no basis to hold him criminally liable. So, yes, um, uh, his comments may be seen as promoting rape uh, or defilement for that matter and therefore must be condemned. But uh, it doesn't give any ground for criminal action. Welcome back to the show. It's still Bloggers Forum here on Ghana Web TV. My name is Abraham Tipa and I am doing this with Abdul Karim Ibrahim. He's a columnist. Nenebi is also a columnist. Right, so let's um, cross over to Councillor Lutrot and then get some response um, to some of the concerns that have been raised. Councillor, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. You... you you mentioned that um, a research was conducted. Uh, who conducted the research and what was it about? Well, when you said a research was conducted, there's a lot of material on people who are, being, who are victims of rape. You can just go and Google and look for it, is there? The attitude of people who have been victims of rape they are what is happening to them the way they are behaving now is a material that is on the net so i can't be pointed and tell you go and read uh social and so chapter from this by read why it is there okay you, you've been tagged as a rape apologist uh some are saying you are justifying aggression of rape with 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 your comments what's what's your say on that what, what is called rape apologist? some also you, you are you are encouraging rape you are making it seem as if rape is something nice from which angle? No, you are encouraging from which angle? Have you got the opportunity to watch the full video? Yes. Did you hear me saying that your father being a pastor and not reporting the rape, the rape is not a check issue? Did you hear that? Yes. What if you cut portions of people's interviews and their videos? You end up getting what you want to use to gratify your personal vindictiveness. You understand know what I'm saying? Mm. So, what is it? Anybody who is descending now will go and watch what the content is. From which particular angle are we discussing? You understand know what I'm saying? Yeah. And if you, and you, you, have, you have the letter too that we read. The letter that we were discussing. That a married man, a married woman for 10 years, it has continually have sexual intercourse with her victim who victimized her and raped her 10 years still in marriage and everybody thinks that she is wrong and i say she told the husband straight ahead it's because of the 10 years of marriage i have not enjoyed anything from you but i enjoy it for my records so once you take the thing out of contest once you decide to look for answers out of contest this is how it will end for you there is a campaign to ask media outlets in Ghana to stop giving you the platform uh, to spread what they say is your damaging message to the masses. Are you aware? It's demonic attack. Because we are speaking truth. My brother, the, the first is that we don't sit unfortunately on any channel to force people to listen to us. One, we also don't come and sit on any channel to counsel anybody. We come and speak to issues, and this is not the first time I'm talking to you. It's a discussion, and these are my opinions. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. So whoever is listening, I have a target market. If what I'm saying doesn't concern you, why do you think uh, it doesn't make sense? Who says what you're saying makes sense? What what particular law has the boy broken under the, 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 the laws we have? You understand what I'm saying? So mm. if somebody breaks a law, so they see a media out. Do entertain him. For what? So a media hub brings me to a studio we are discussing. Then they give me a manuscript to read. They say you are influencing what people negatively. What do you call negative influence? After this, there have been a lot of people who are rushing to come and seek for help because they are practicing wrong social vices in their marriage. When you pay me for a radio station, who loses it? It's the world that they're talking. The whole world that loses what I'm going to hear. But there's more media who still let people know the truth. What will you say if you are asked to take a break from, from the spotlight and do an introspection? 
Nobody called me into the spotlight, so I'm not taking a break from the spotlight. But let the one who called me tell me, son, take a break from the spotlight. That he's not said that. All right, thank you, Councillor, for speaking to us. So, um, Karim, obviously, um, Lutrot seems unapologetic. He he's unperturbed about the comments. Yeah. But what do you say to that? Uh, I'm, I'm it's, it's pretty obvious. I'm not surprised uh, because if you have followed what he has done all along, I think that he's been very calculated, very deliberate about it. And so this is not a, this is not somebody whose comments you can consider as say a slip of tongue or somebody who uh, made a mistake. Mm. I mean, this is this is him. This is what they say brand. This is his brand, and it is a very acerbic one. It's it's one that um, projects him as a provocateur, and so that is essentially who he is. So I'm not surprised that he would stand by those comments, because this is not the first time. He has said something controversial, or maybe rightly in this case, um, inappropriate, because and very offensive, and and that is what keeps him in the media. He's realized because what he sells is counselling mm. that this is somebody who has some knowledge and expertise in advising people. But he was also very intelligent to realize that he he is not so great at that. I mean, if you wanted counsellors, we would probably be looking at. Um, uh, Dr. Riafia Kenten and the rest from the University of Ghana who are professionals in that space. And so he knows very well that to be able to keep himself in there, he should do exactly what the Shatawalis, what the, I mean, you would know all, all of them, mm -hmm. what they do. And so essentially, he is um, a psychologist in the showbiz sense of it. And so there's no way that anybody should expect that somebody like him. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you are aware of um, Alex Jones, of Infowars in the US. That is him. He's made a lot of money from simply peddling falsehood. So coronavirus will come and he will say that, well, this is not real. This is something that the Chinese government has sat somewhere, want to take over the world, and, and, and thousands of people go out there and watch him. So that is the kind of character we are looking at here. And there are many of him across the world. In, in Malaysia, for instance, there's a, there's a young chap who calls himself a professional provocateur. He just goes around offending people and, and makes a lot of money from it. So the media appreciates that. We understand that fully. And that's why we engage him. As Nene mentioned earlier, it's, it's about clout. It's about interest. I am sure that merely by titling this episode of Bloggers Forum with something Councillor Lutrot in it, mm -hmm. I want to believe that you get more views than you have ever had in, in, the, in the course of this period that you've been doing this show. That's how it is. So, the moral question then would be, is it okay for the media and for he himself, Councillor Lutro, to continue to benefit from this very negative attitude and all of that? And the answer, obviously, if you're coming from the moral point of view, would be to say no. But what is also quite clear is that it pays the bills. Mm. And the lawyers have spoken to this. To the extent that he has not done anything criminal, it would be very difficult for anybody to remove him and all of that. I mean, everybody's chasing him to get a response. He, he, he has been saying that um, he, it appears people are taking him out of context because um, oh, nah. <laughs> the, 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 the basis for yeah. that conversation was yeah. a lady who is married yes. but still goes back to someone who slept with her earlier. Yeah. And so... That's what he says, that uh, people who, 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 who have been raped, everyone enjoys it because if you did not enjoy it, why do you still go back to the person? I think that's completely silly. I mean, if he, if he, if he appreciates the subject he was speaking on and is anything like the counsellor that he thinks he is, mm. he should know very well that there's, there's such a thing as, as coerced consent. So people, I mean, it, there's, there's enough publication on this. So people who were abused when they were kids, even people belong to a certain sexual orientation today, merely because of the fact that that is something that they were put into at a point when they were children and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So for whatever it is, I mean, people cling onto their own abusers and all of that. So if you understand that, 
you cannot use that as grounds to then explain this point away. Mm -hmm. Because if you appreciate consent, you would know very well that it would not be rape if people liked it. So then, the fact that somebody goes back to somebody who abused them, I mean, again, people practice BDSM. I mean, they just like pleasure from the pain that comes with it and all of it. There are different spectrums when it comes to some of these things. So for anybody who has the, the slightest of information or knowledge about this, you would not be making that conclusion that, that he is coming to. So I don't believe that it is the case that people have misunderstood him. Mm -hmm. I think he's obviously a pervert who is just riding on some of these controversial things just to make money, and you know, that's what it is. Nene, do, 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 do you expect an uh, apology from him? Uh, an apology from yes. him. Yes. Must if, he apologize? If I was, he apologize? If I was him, I won't apologize. If mm -hmm. I was his PR advice, I'll advise him to apologize. Because the moment you apologize for anything, you've lost uh, you've lost your relevance. Even when almost everyone yeah, is saying Yeah, the moment you apologize, you've lost your relevance. Because that means that um, people cannot engage you again. Mm. So from a PR perspective, it's a bad idea to apologize. So yes, like he rightly put, uh, pointed out, he is doing the taking the right PR approach by not apologizing. However, is it, should he apologize? That question also, I don't have a yes or no answer for. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because this 2028 cancel culture, apologize for everything you say culture that we are living in. I am zero percent for it mm. because the moment you start telling people to apologize for every silly thing they say it's like you are empowering uh, the cans not cancelers the cancel cancelers i mm. mean the c-a-n c-e-l -E mm. yes people who like to cancel people for having any position they don't agree with yeah. i think that i hate those group of people I don't want to do anything that will empower those group of people by feeding them by, you know, apologizing for any time somebody says anything dumb, right? Mm -hmm. Anytime anybody is stupid, they don't have to have to apologize to the internet for being stupid. All right, so we cross over to speak with Seth Mousy Asafo. He's a licensed clinical psychologist, a lecturer at the University of Ghana Medical School a lead psychologist at um, Calm Center to get his views on this issue. Uh, thanks for joining us, sir. You're welcome. So as a psychologist um, who engages victims of, of um, rape and several other issues, how do you digest this? Well, um, I, I think that uh, it's, it's a bit insensitive to say that all rape victims enjoy the act I mean, in the process, okay, mm. um, I think basically this is what we call the rape culture, okay? Now, the rape culture is a mindset that perhaps because somebody um, during an act, okay, may act, maybe get wet or get an erection or maybe moan or something of that sort, it sort of means that they're enjoying the act. But there are two very different things that we need to understand. Okay. Mm. There's something we call physical excitation. Physical excitation has to do with the way that our organs function. Okay, As a sex organ, when it is stimulated, any sexual stimulation will cause it to react. The reaction is normally what you see. Okay, mm. But that does not in any way mean that the person is enjoying it or that the person has consented basically. All right? mm. Now, one of the things that we we'll normally do would be to make a, a comparison of an act in cohesion and an act without cohesion and subjectively have people rate to see if they say that the level of pleasure was the same. You find that it is never true. Now, there's a concept that we call arousal non-concordance, okay? Mm. And basically, this is as a result of what we call conditioning. Humans are conditioned to react in certain ways to certain stimuli. So, as a result of the conditioning, things happen, but that does not in any way mean that they enjoy it. Interestingly, working with people who have been through um, some form of rape or sexual violence, one thing that comes out very significantly is a lot of them as a result of the anxiety they face, 
partly due to stigma and partly due to the fact that they've been violated, okay? Mm -hmm. They are unable to deal with that process to the point that psychologists, we call something defense mechanisms. They adapt defense mechanisms. Now, these defense mechanisms prevent you from experiencing anxiety, mm. okay? So, basically, most of them will have what we call a repression, where the, the thoughts and the feelings surrounding that particular event, okay, mm. are stored in their subconscious mind. So, it's as if it never happened. For some instances, okay, not all instances, but for a lot of the instances that we have seen, that's something that happens. So, I've had to work with people who have gotten married, and before getting married, they've always said they were virgins. Because in, because the, the reality is, the rape incident that took place some years ago, which was which is usually in their earlier years, okay, mm -hmm. had caused them to feel so much anxiety, their mind, in order to protect them, hid it away from consciousness. Only for it to resurface at the trigger of a sexual encounter with their husband. Mm. So I've had a client who has actually stabbed the husband. I've had a client who's bitten off the husband's ear because it reminded them or it killed back all the memory. So even if in that instance, the physical sensations are causing physical excitation, it does not in any way mean that psychologically and emotionally they are within the act or they want to do the act. Mm. So that becomes very erroneous to make a statement to say that all rape victims enjoy. It is not true. Okay, thank you so much for your time, and uh, we we so much appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, so that was um, Mr. Seth Mausi Asafu, is a licensed clinical psychologist and lecturer at the University of Ghana Medical School, and the lead psychologist at Calm Center. We will take a break here. When we return, um, I don't know whether or not you've registered for the voters' ID to be able to vote in the 2020 general elections of course some people have registered but they say they will not vote uh, yes they just want to have the id card but have you registered or you are here to or you don't want to register we'll have that conversation after this break because even nelson obaya santua the woman that led the vigil doomsa vigil is asking you to stay home because the politicians want to kill you Actress Yvonne Nelson is saying that uh, people who have not registered for the voter's ID uh, shouldn't bother at all. Now, this is her tweet. Politician, stay home, stay safe. People, okay. Politician, go out and register. People, okay. Me, the politician doesn't care about you. Use your common sense. This election won't change anything in your life. Joining crowded queues and dangers your life. That's her tweet. And um, we all know the coronavirus that um, the country is fighting now. We, we've crossed 23,000 confirmed cases. Active cases is near 5,000. And um, as it stands, 129 persons have unfortunately succumbed to the disease. Karim, have you registered? No, I'm not. Not. No, when I'm do you not. intend to register? I, I'm not quite sure. Or if I you would. don't. You don't. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I, I, if I would. Register. Why? Uh, well, um, a couple of um, reasons. None, like what Yvonne Nelson is saying in the news. Mm. Um, it's uh, for me. It's just it's just been about the the time, and then again also about the the, the health concerns. Mm. I owing to these two, if, if it so happens that there is a safer way for me and I have time, I, I would register. I have nothing against the process itself or the election itself. It's just that um, in terms of maybe priorities, I've not found the registration a very big one that um, uh, takes away the other concerns or issues that I have. So maybe that's just it. I, I am tempted to ask Nene a similar question, uh -huh. but I, 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 it seems to me I know the answer already. So, <laughs> what are you trying to say? What, say, say what you are thinking. What are, what are you trying to I say? I know you 
you <laughs> you don't register. <laughs> I will register. Even if they give you one million dollars, oh, I register. You, so you you register. I have I registered. Register. I have not registered, but mm -hmm. I register. The reason why I register is that, you see, I care about money. I'm mm -hmm. a capitalist, first and foremost. And usually, the most credible ID card in Ghana, probably apart from it. The driving li driver's license and passport mm. is the voter's ID card. That's what most businesses in Ghana accept for the purpose of doing business. So I'll probably register for the purpose of doing business. Okay. Then you don't have to do it now. You can do it. Yes. Do it later. Obviously. Yeah. When uh, I think it's uh, safer. When not safer. I don't really care about that part. <laughs> when I think it's uh, convenient for me, mm. yeah, because I have to go and register in my village. Okay. L looking at the. The circumstance yeah. we find ourselves now and the measures that have been put in place. You think people who go to register are risking their lives? The safest thing about the, to do about COVID right now is to contract the virus. If you get the virus, then your body can start developing antibodies uh, for it to fight it when you get it later on but what if you die people are dying so why would you want to contract death, death because you want to get death, the antibodies death is a risk we all take by being alive when i was coming here i came in the car i could have died in a car accident and um, i ate this morning i could have choked on water death is a risk you take every day for being alive so i'm not really a big fan of living in the fear of death mm. Karim, are you are you okay with how this um, registration and the COVID issue is being handled? Um, I'm not, but just just before I do that, if you permit me, I mm. I take a very strong exception to Nene's point. So okay. I, I guess I'd have to very quickly engage that. Um, I like how philosophical it's sounding with how. Why, as yeah. we live, yeah. we, I'm not yeah. sounding philosophical for the point of sounding philosophical. That's how I live my life. No, no, I, I get it. I'm just saying that it's a very philosophical thing to say mm -hmm. that um, we, by by merely living, I mean that's that we are we're taking risk to eventually die. I mean, all, all of us are going to die somehow. But but then again, um, there is a reason. A lot of people. I mean, if you look at the the victims. Those who are worst hit, like communities, for instance, if you look at all the protocols that so far can help us address this problem, you would find that the poorer you are, the, the riskier it is for you. And in many instances, of course, the rich people die, poor people die, and all of that. So that, that means that any approach that we take must be very sensitive of all of these. Other than that, we are treading the part of um, eugenics. We are treading the part of saying that, well, let it be, let the strongest survive. Because, as you're saying, the COVID-19 and all the issues that surround it keep changing. Even the point that contract the virus and you develop an antibody, it's not conclusive. Mm. That, but that point is not exclusive to COVID. That's yes. co that is exclusive to every disease. Yes, and, and, and especially yeah. for COVID, I would even argue that it is even riskier to take that chance because you must have a strong immune system to be able to at least fight it. And there's no proof to suggest that if you contract the coronavirus and then you are cured of it, you develop an immunity to it. That means that there's the likelihood of contracting it again. Mm. So if you go the way Nene is advocating, for instance, how many times do you have to contract it to be safe? And mind you, even those who um, get safe or recover from it, there's also a lot of publications and research that suggest that you don't have your full body in, in the way that it was before you contracted the virus. Mm. I mean, even in terms of amnesia, people develop amnesia, people develop so many other things. That means that this is very risky, and so it would be very reckless for anybody to take that sort of action. I mean, we're seeing it in, in Sweden. Herd immunity, let the people go and get it and things will be fine. But things are really not fine because if you compare Sweden against their neighbors in the Scandinavian area, what you'd find is that Finland 
have been able to do better in terms of cutting down the number of people who fall to COVID-19. Um, Norway uh, have done better, as against Sweden and all of that. And so there's, there's not much there to, 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 to learn from. And so the best you must do is try as much as possible to avoid it. But, but that's, 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 that's the side. I'll just go to Arvind's first point very quickly. Yeah. Uh, see, Arvind, I think that if you look at the situation that we find ourselves in, I mean, it's difficult to know what else someone must do to, to address this. And so it's a tight position that we are in. There are a lot of things that we could have done to not put ourselves in the condition that we are in, especially if you come to this uh, Buddhist registration thing. We could have decided as a country to say, well, we're not going to go through this process at all, or two. We're not going to even conduct elections at all. But the point is that as the rhetoric has come to be, this has come to stay with us, we must find a way. The only thing we can always constantly do is to find what better alternatives exist to allow us to go through the process. Because, I mean, if you follow the politics, the Electoral Commission started, made the point that this voter register uh, that we have is not fit for purpose before COVID-19 hit Ghana. So if that point is true, then it means that if we use the current register, the outcome of that register being used for election would mean that that would not be credible. Yeah. So you cannot therefore say that, well, COVID is dangerous, so let's go ahead and use the register that the institution that is organizing the election says that it's not credible. Mm -hmm. What at all would they be overseeing then? So would you say, for instance, that today, if a coup happened and someone else became president, that would be okay because going to the post to conduct elections or to vote was risky because of COVID-19. Mm. So it, it's, a, it's a very difficult position to be in, but what we can do is to make the systems better, and I don't think the Electoral Commission has done that very well so far. I see. Um, Nene, you, you think the, the, the citizens are being careful enough from, from what you've seen at these registration centers? Um, the answer would be no, but I don't blame the citizens for that. Law enforcement? Not law enforcement, I say government communication. Mm. Because the government communication on the COVID thing is not consistent or it's not, um, what's the name, what's the word I should use? It's not consistent because the government doesn't seem to have a position on the COVID pandemic and how it, is, it should handle it. Mm. In the examples I gave, whether you agree with the position of the government or not, the government took a position. You understand? Yeah. But in Ghana, a government has not taken the position. One, the president will say, uh, what's the name? We can't bring back people from, what did they say? Yeah. We know how to bring back the economy. Yeah. Yeah. We know how to bring and back the economy. And then the next week, he yeah. opened up the economy. Yeah. Mm. So you, you ask yourself, did he figure out how to bring back people from the dead the following week? Mm. So you see, because... And that, that, that's because they, they have been told that the, the COVID is here to stay, so we should find a way to so live our normal lives. The government has not done a good job in communicating that to the citizen because the government opened schools. Mm. Where not, not all schools. Final year opened students. schools where kids will be sitting in classrooms. He opened churches. You understand? Mm. And so... Let's forget about everything else. Schools and churches are the places where people congregate the most in this country. Mm. And so when you open schools and open churches, and you tell churches that they should... Uh, one hour. One, one hour. hour. No more My than church, Pentecost, we use one hour, 30 minutes for just announcement. <laughs> so what I'm going to use one hour for? I don't think there's any of... Apart from the Orthodox churches, mm. I don't think there's any church that is... Uh, obeying the one hour rule. You understand? Mm. So, that has conditioned the mind of the people that it is safe to congregate because we are congregating in church anyway. Our kids are congregating in schools anyway. So, we can also congregate everywhere else. Mm. So, I think the government communication and the actions the government have taken because in the states, some states, I know that specifically 
in California state, right? The churches are still closed, even though, the, even though voter registration is going on. Mm. And because the churches are still closed, it gives the people the mental picture that this thing is still dangerous. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to go out. So the people take the measures they're supposed to take because of the actions the government took. And so I think the government have told the people implicitly mm -hmm. that they can take, they can congregate how they want to. All right, so we wrapping up, but um, that will not be without your final words on the show. Karim? Well, um, I think that um, for very quickly on Councillor Lushot, uh, it's, it's very important that we target our activism very well. I think that for media houses, they rely on what they get from their audience. And the perception is that the audience have come to like this content, and that is why they keep going in circles and bringing them back. Mm. So I would hope that whatever issues that we have must be targeted at media houses and we must call media houses out for it. If we have to boycott media houses, we have to boycott media houses so that they know that wherever their monies are coming from, the people from that end who say that we don't want this anymore. And maybe finally on the voters registration thing, I don't think that people who go out there are stupid. I think that, I mean, you saw in the US how people went onto the streets and I mean, around the world, really, when they were told that COVID is real and they previously were under lockdown and all of that after George Floyd's murder. Yeah. The point is that at every point when something, a certain existential threat or injustice is faced you, you more likely are going to react to that as against a certain distant virus that may be coming to attack you. I mean, if you go to the voters registration center, you came before Abrantepa but you are keeping a social distance and so between Nene and I there's a distance and then someone else comes and comes to fail in there I mean you get angry you probably are going to touch the press you're probably going to fight so it works more when you go and you are sitting very close to Nene so that you don't allow room for anybody to come in like these are basic human behavioral uh, instincts and nobody will allow you to take advantage of that these are the things that are causing the, the problem at the registration centers you would find that when they are very close to the point of registration and where the seats are, they can keep all of that. But it's always where the queues are being formed and all of that. So we need to check those things and extend whatever surveillance that we have to those people. As for people going out to register and vote, they are not stupid. We are practicing democracy. We called for it. Nene, final words. So I want to end by, you know, saying Coaching. that... <laughs> <laughs> but saying that I'm happy that finally I get to talk about my celebrity crush on your show mm. Yvonne Nelson oh, okay mm. I never she, knew she, <laughs> <laughs> she's, my, she's my Ghana celebrity crush I have like five celebrity crushes okay yeah, I see like my Ghana celebrity crush. but the thing that she said that the, nothing is going to change mm -hmm. after the election yeah 100% that's the uh, first rule that every human being is supposed to learn when it comes to democracy. Democracy is just so we create a system where the country can move on so that you as an individual can do well for yourself. You understand? Um, the governments that we've had from since the Kuma out of Batron to date have not done anything to change the lives of the citizens and will not in future do anything to change the lives of the citizens. So, you know, everyone for himself, stay safe. <laughs> All right. That's how we end this episode of Bloggers Forum. I have been on the show with Abdul Karim Ibrahim, who is a columnist. Nenebi is also a columnist. My name is Benefo Boabin Abrantipa. <laughs>